Welcome. This is the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 1 to 11 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda. A course hosted by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg in collaboration with the Barrett Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we are going to look at sermon number 10. But before that, I have again a few things from the forum discussion and the last sermon. So one comment by Robert Grosch was on this book by Berbeer that I gave a short excerpt. And he says, with denying Anicca, in my view, the whole foundation of the edifice of the early Buddhist teaching is thrown out of the window. And he says, though I realize that two passages taken out of a book on their own certainly do not reflect the full position of the author. Yeah, I, I agree with Robert, what Robert says, and somebody else also asked uh, what were the other points that I found difficult with the book. And so I thought that since it is on the same topic as these lectures, it is on title is Seeing that Freeze Meditations on Emptiness and Dependent Arising by Bob Robert. I just thought I, I say a few more things that I, I believe are problematic. So one is uh, what I think is a kind of, I mean, uh, I, I need to first of all say that whatever I'm saying now is from the viewpoint of early Buddhism. Only. So page 137, there's always a sense of self to some degree whenever there is any experience of anything. And 250, the experience, the perception of a phenomenon depends on clinging. For a thing to appear as that thing for consciousness, to be consolidated into an experience, it needs a certain amount of clinging. Yeah, from an early Buddhist viewpoint, this this is this this does not work, because an arahant has experience, but there is no clinging. So I think this is a. I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the implication of the final goal, and another equally fundamental misunderstanding comes about. Uh, uh, what is Nibbana? So page 399, he speaks about a conception of Nirvana, the goal of the path as some kind of cessation of appearances and manifestation is no longer ultimately meaningful. Page 401, an unremitting exploration of fabrication and dependent arising opens a vision of the world as nirvana, a world of magical appearances, groundless and thoroughly empty yet mystically appearing. And page 402. Even if there has been some sense of disenchantment brought about through practice, we can see now that going deeper into an experiential understanding of emptiness profoundly and wonderfully re-enchants this whole world of phenomenal appearances. And then he points out that the word Sanskrit in Sanskrit, this is a Sankita condition in Pali, which we have been translating as fabricated and concocted, can also mean consecrated, sanctified, hallowed. For this is the felt sense we have with a certain depth of insight into fabrication. Rather than only negative connotations, now the intimations in the sense of the fabricated are of holiness, sacredness, purity and mystery. Yeah, this is also totally different from the early Buddhist viewpoint. There is nothing about uh, moving from dispassion and disenchantment to becoming re-enchanted. And there's also no mystification of the world as the sacred or the holy. 
So I think this is much is enough. I don't want to spend more time. I just want to say that this book, however, is full of deep insights about meditation practice. There's a, lots of wonderful points in the book. So what I'm saying is simply that the, the, there is a trend in later tradition to reinterpret certain concepts. And this trend is obvious also in this book. And simply for anybody who is operating within the framework of early Buddhist thought and aiming at the type of liberation that is envisioned in early Buddhist thought, such a book cannot serve as a guide. One can simply pick out individual insights, but one cannot use it as a guide for one's practice because it is clearly based on premises and aims at a final type of realization that is substantially different from early Buddhism. And there was uh, something, a comment from Kim Allen. All mind objects have the essence of deliverance. Anything can serve for liberation by seeing through it with wisdom. Of course, Nibbana is always available, no matter what is happening. And she adds, it is the right kind of knowing that frees the mind in all situations, regardless of what object is present. This was what I wanted to share in terms of comments. And now we are ready to go into sermon number 10. Hitang santang, itang panitang, yadidang sab sankara samato, sab upari patini sango, tanatan kayo, virago nirodho nipbana. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely, the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor and the assembly of the venerable meditative monks. This is the tenth sermon in the series of sermons on Nibbana. With the help of a parable based on the problem of the gem in the Ummagajataka, we made an attempt, towards the end of our last sermon, to clarify to some extent how the personality view arises due to the ignorance of the fact that name and form is something reflected on consciousness. We mentioned in brief how a certain would-be wise man took the trouble to empty a pond and even dig out the mud under the impression that there is actually a gem in it simply because there appeared to be a gem in the pond. Similarly, by taking to be real name and form, which is only an image reflected on consciousness, leading to a personality view, Sakankaya Dipti, both eternalism and nihilism, built on the two views of existence and non-existence, tended towards two extremes. Under the influence of self-love, Eternalism took up the view that there is a self and looked forward to its perpetuation. Prompted by self-hate, annihilationism or nihilism cherished the fond hope that the release from the self will occur at death. Both these extreme views confused the issue by not understanding the reflected image as such. Now, how did the middle path which the Buddha introduced to the world Avoid these two extremes. It is by offering a knowledge and vision of things as they are, yatha bhuta jnana dasana, in place of those two views of existence and non-existence. In other words, he made known to the world the true knowledge and vision that name and form is merely an image reflected on consciousness. There is a special significance in the word yatha bhuta. In contradistinction to the two words bhava and vibhava, the word bhuta has some peculiarity of its own. In order to clarify the meaning of the term yatha bhuta, we can draw upon a discourse in the Ittivuttaka, a few lines of which we had already quoted at the end of the previous sermon. When presented in full, that discourse will make it clear why the Buddha introduced the word Bhuta in preference to the existing usage in terms of Bhava and Vibhava. 
This is how the discourse proceeds. Dvihi bhikkhave dittika tehi pariyottita deva manusa oliyanti eke atidhavanti eke chakkumantova passanti katancha bhikkhave oliyanti eke bhava rama bhikkhave deva manusa bhavarta bhava samudvita te sang bhava nirodhaya dhamme desiyamane chittam napak Handatina Pasidatina Santitati Nadhimochati Evanko Bhikavi Ulianti Eke Katancha Bhikavi Ati Dhavanti Eke Bhave Neva Kopana Eke Atantiyamana Harayamana Jiguchamana Bibhavan Avinandanti Yatta Kira Boyang Atta Kayasa Beda Parang Marana Uchidjati Vinasatina Hoti Parang Marana Etang santang etang panitang etang yathavanti. Evang ko bhikkavi ati dhavanti eke. Katancha bhikkavi chakkumanto passanti. Ida bhikkavi bhotang bhotato passati. Bhotang bhotato disva bhotasya nibhidhaya viraghaya niruddhaya patipanno hoti. Evang ko bhikkavi chakkumanto va passanti eke. Obsessed by two views, monks are God and man, some of whom lag behind while others overreach. Only they do see that have eyes to see. How monks do some lag behind? Gods and men, monks, delight in existence. They are attached to existence. They rejoice in existence. When Dhamma is being preached to them for the cessation of existence, their minds do not reach out towards it. Do not get pleased in it. Do not get steadied in it. Do not rest confident with it. It is thus that some lag behind. How monks do some overreach? Being troubled, ashamed and disgusted of existence as such, some delight in non-existence. Since this self, at the breaking up of his body after death, will be annihilated and destroyed. This is peace. This is excellent. This is how it should be. Thus monks do some overreach. And how monks do those with eyes see? Herein a monk sees the become as become. Having seen the become as become, he is treading the path towards dejection, dispassion and cessation regarding becoming. Thus it is monks that those with eyes see. Comment uh, translation by Ireland. Because held by two kinds of views, some devas and men hold back, and some overreach, only those with vision see. And how bhikkhus do some hold back? Devas and men enjoy being, delight in being, are satisfied with being. When Dhamma is taught to them for the cessation of being, their minds do not enter into it, and acquire confidence in it, or settle upon it, or become resolved on it. Thus Bhikkhus do some hold back. <coughs> How Bhikkhus do some overreach? Now some are troubled, ashamed and disgusted by this very same being and they rejoice in the idea of non-being, asserting, inasmuch as this self good serves, when the body perishes at death, is annihilated and destroyed and does not exist after death. This is peaceful, this is excellent, this is reality. Thus because to some overreach. How because to those with vision see? Herein a bhikkhu sees what has come to be as having come to be. Having seen it thus, he practices the cause for turning away, for dispassion, for the cessation of what has come to be. Thus because to those with vision see. End of comment. <coughs> This passage clearly brings out the extreme nature of those two views of existence and non-existence. The two verses occurring at the end of the sutta present the gist of the discourse even more clearly. Ye bhūtaṁ bhūtato disva bhūta sucha atikkamaṁ yatha bhūte vimuchanti bhavatanha parikkaya Save bhūta parinyo so Vita tanho bhava bhave, bhūtasa vibhava bhikkhu, 
Nagat Chitti Punna Bhavam. Those who have seen the become has become, as well as the going beyond of whatever has become, are released in regard to things as they are, by the exhaustion of craving for becoming. That monk who has fully comprehended the become, who is devoid of craving for continued becoming, by the discontinuation of what has become, will not come back again to a state of becoming. Comment, uh, translation by Ireland. Having seen what has come to be as having come to be, passing beyond what has come to be, they are released in accordance with truth by exhausting the craving for being. When a bhikkhu has fully understood that which has come to be as such, free from craving to be this or that, by the extinction of what has come to be, he comes no more to renewal of being. End of comment. Now, it is extremely clear, even from the quotation as it stands, that the Buddha has interposed this word Bhuta between the dichotomous terms Bhava and Vibhava. In the contemporary society, these two terms were used to denote the existence and the destruction of a soul. This usage, this usage is clearly revealed by some discourses in which those who held on to similar views expressed them in such terms as Bhavisami and Nabhavisami. These expressions, meaning I will be and I will not be, carry with them an implication of a person or a self. The term Bhuta, on the other hand, is not amenable to such a usage. It has the passive sense of something that has become. Like that reflection mentioned earlier, it conveys the idea of being produced by causes and conditions. Going by the analogy of the reflected image mentioned above, the eternalist, because of his narcissistic self-love, gets attached to his own self-image and lags behind. When the Buddha preaches the Dhamma for the cessation of existence, he shrinks from fear that it would lead to the destruction of his self. It is like the narcissistic attempt to embrace one's own image in water, out of self-love. The annihilationist view leads to an attitude of escapism, like that of one who is obsessed by his own shadow. One cannot outstrip one's own shadow. It is only a vain attempt. So also is the fond hope of the nihilist, that by simply negating self, one can be free from repeated birth. It turns out to be mere wishful thinking, because simply by virtue of the view I shall not be after death, one cannot win deliverance, so long as such defilements like ignorance and craving are there. These were the two extremes towards which those dogmatic views of eternalism and annihilationism tended. <clears throat> by introducing the term Bhuta, the Buddha made it known that the five groups are the product of causes and conditions, that they are conditionally arisen. In the Itivuttaka, for instance, one comes across the following significant lines Jatang Bhotang Samuppanang Kattang Sankatam Abduang. The reference here is to the five groups of grasping. They are born, become, arisen, that is, conditionally arisen, made up, prepared, and unstable. These words are suggestive of some artificiality. The word Adhuan brings out the impermanence and insubstantiality. There is no eternal essence like Sat or Being. It is merely a self-image, a reflection. So it seems that the word Bhuta has connotations of being a product of causes and conditions. Therefore, in spite of the scare it has aroused in the soul theorists, Nibbana is not something that destroys a truly existing entity. Though Nibbana is called Bhavanirodha, cessation of existence, according to the outlook of the Buddha, the worldlings have merely a craving for existence, Bhavatanha, and not a real existence. It is only a conceit of existence, the conceit M, Asmimana. In reality, it amounts to a craving 
And this is the significance of the term tanha pono bhavika, craving which makes for really coming. Because of that craving, which is always bent forward, whirlings keep running round in samsara. But on an analysis, a concrete situation always reveals a state of a become, a bhuta, as something produced by causes and conditions. A donkey drags a wagon when a carrot is projected towards it from the wagon. The journey of beings in samsara is something like that. So what we have here is not the destruction of some existing essence of being or soul. From the point of view of the Dhamma, the cessation of existence or Bhavanirudha amounts to a stopping of the process of becoming by the removal of the causes leading to it, namely ignorance and craving. It is, in effect, the cessation of suffering itself. Those who held on to the annihilationist view entertained the hope that their view itself entitled them to their cherished goal. But it was in vain, because the ignorance, craving and grasping within them created for them the five groups of grasping, or this mass of suffering, again and again, despite their view. So what we have here is a deep philosophy of things as they are, which follows a certain law of causality. The Buddha's middle path is based on this knowledge and vision of things as they are, avoiding both extremes of self-indulgence and self-mortification. <coughs> Let us now consider the question of existence involved in this context. The terms bhava and vibhava are generally associated with the idea of world's existence. Some seem to take atti or is as the basic element in the grammatical structure. Very often those upholders of dogmatic views brought up such propositions as everything exists, sabbang atti, and nothing exists. Sambhang Nati before the Buddha, expecting him to give a categorical answer. But the Buddha pointed out that Asmi or Am is more basic than the usage of is and is not. The most elementary concept is Asmi or Am, hence the term Asmi Mana, the conceit Am. In the grammatical structure, the pride of place should be given to Asmi or Am. We sometimes tend to regard atti or is as the primary term, but asmi deserves pride of place in so far as it is the basic element in the grammatical structure. It is like the central peg from which all measurings and surveyings of the world start. Since the word mana and asmi mana also means measuring, given asmi or m, everything else comes to be. Let us take an illustration. If, for instance, we say there is something, someone will pose the question, where is it? It should be either here, or there, or yonder, that is, over there. It can be in one of those three places. Now, if it is here, how does that place come to become, become a here? That is where I am. There is where he is, and yonder is where you are. So we have here the framework of the grammar. Here is the basic lining up for the formation of the grammatical structure, its most elementary pattern. So then I am, you are, and he is. In this way we see that one can speak of the existence of something relative to a viewpoint represented by M or I am. That is why the Buddha rejected as extremes the two views of absolute existence and absolute non-existence, based on is atti and is not natti. Only when there is an I can something exist relative to that I. And that something, if it is there, it is where I am not present or at a distance from me. If it is yonder or over there, 
it is before you who are in front of me, and if it is here, it is beside me. From this we can see that this conceit M is, as it were, the origin of the whole world, the origin of the world of grammar. On a previous occasion, too, while discussing the significance of the two terms itta bhava and anyatta bhava, we had to make a similar statement. The Buddha draws our attention to a very important fact in this concern, namely the fact that the conceit M does not arise without causes and conditions. It is not something uncaused and unconditioned. If it is uncaused and unconditioned, it can never be made to cease. The notion M arises due to certain causes and conditions. There is a word suggestive of its causal origin, namely Upadaya. Now, for instance, we use the term Panchupadana Kandaha. When we speak of the five groups of grasping, the word Upadana, Upa plus A plus Da, is often rendered by grasping. The prefix upa is supposed to imply the tenacity of the hold. One can therefore ask whether it is not sufficient to relax the hold on the five groups. Strictly speaking, the prefix upa in upadana conveys the sense of proximity or nearness. Sometimes the two words upeti and upadiyati are found in juxtaposition. Upeti Upa plus e to go means coming near or approaching, and opadiati has the sense of holding on to, having come close. In other words, we have here not only a case of holding, but of holding on to. So the totality of existence from the viewpoint of, from the point of view of Dhamma is dependent on a holding on or a grasping on. It is not something uncaused and unconditioned. Here we may remind ourselves of the simile of the winding of a rope or cord, which we brought up in a previous sermon. We cannot help going back to the same simile again and again, if we are to deepen our understanding of the Dhamma. In that illustration we spoke of two persons winding up several strands to make a rope or a cord but both are winding in the same direction from either end. Such an attempt at winding, however long it is continued, does not result in an actual winding, for the simple reason that the winding from one end is continually being unwinded from the other end. But what happens if a third person catches hold of the rope in the middle? Due to that hold on the middle, something like a rope appears to get winded up. Now existence, too, is something similar. It is because of the hold in the middle that the rope gets wound up. From the point of view of an outsider, the one in the middle is holding on to a rope. But the truth is that the semblance of a rope is there due to that holding on itself. This, then, is the norm of this world. Whatever is of a nature to arise, all that is of a nature to cease. Yang Kinji Samudaya Dhammang Sambang Tang Nirodha Dhammang. It is in the nature of things that every winding ends up in an unwinding. But because of that hole in the middle, the windings get accumulated. Just because of his hold in the middle, his hand is under stress and strain. Similarly, the stress and strain that is existence is also due to a grasping or holding on to, upadana banchaya bhavo. In fact, we have not given this illustration merely for the sake of a simile. We can adduce reasons for its validity even from the discourses. This word upadaya is particularly noteworthy. <coughs> As we have already shown, Upadana does not simply mean grasping or grasping rigidly, but holding on to something, having come close to it. This holding on creates a certain relationship, which may be technically termed a relativity. The two stand relative to each other. For instance, that rope 
exists relative to the grasping of the person who holds onto it. Na Upadai is the absolutive form of Upadana and has the implication of something relative. There is a discourse in the Kanda Samyutta which clearly reveals this fact. It is a sermon preached by Venerable Punnamantani Putta to Venerable Ananda. This is the relevant paragraph. Upadaya usu ananda asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Kincha upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Rupa upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Vedana upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Sanya upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Sankari upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Vinyana upadaya asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Upadaya vusu ananda asmi tihoti no anupadaya. Seyatapya vusu ananda itintiva purisuva dharo yuva mandakajatiko adasiva parisutunde pariyodhate achiva udakapate sakkang mokkanimittang pachirikkamano Upadhaya paseya no anupadaya. Eva meva koavo suananda. Upadhaya smiti hoti no anupadaya. Let us not try to get at the meaning of this important passage, which should clarify further what we have already attempted to explain through similes. It is with dependence, friend Ananda, that the notion M occurs, not without dependence. With dependence on what does the notion M occur, and not without dependence? With dependence on form does the notion M occur, not without dependence? With dependence on feeling does the notion M occur, not without dependence? With dependence on perception does the notion M occur, not without dependence? With dependence on preparations does the notion M occur, not without dependence? With dependence on consciousness, does the notion M occur not without dependence? Just as, friend Dhananda, a woman or a man, youthful and fond of adornment, in looking at her or his facial image in a mirror or in a bowl filled with pure, clear, clean water, would be seeing it with dependence and not without dependence. Even so, friend Dhananda, it is with dependence that the notion M occurs, not without dependence. Comment, translation by Bhikkhubodhi. It is by clinging, Ananda, that the notion I am occurs, not without clinging. And by clinging to what does I am occur, not without clinging. It is by clinging to form that I am occurs, not without clinging. It is by clinging to feeling, to perception to volitional formations, to consciousness, that I am occurs, not without clinging. Suppose, friend Ananda, a young woman or a man, youthful and fond of ornaments, would examine her own facial image in a mirror or in a bowl, filled with pure, clear, clean water. She would look at it with clinging, not without clinging. So too, it is by clinging to form that I am occurs, not without clinging. And here's my translation of the Samyutta Agama parallel. Ananda, it is by clinging to states that one conceives I am this, not without clinging to states. Ananda, by clinging to what states does one conceive I am this, not without clinging to them. Clinging to bodily form, one clings to it as I am this, not without clinging to it. Clinging to feeling, perception formations, consciousness. One clings to it as I am this, not without clinging to it. Just as a person who holds in his hand a clear mirror or clean water in a bowl as a mirror and clings to it to see his own face, who sees because of clinging to the mirror, not without clinging to it. End of comment. In fact, it is rather difficult to render the word upadaya. It means independence on something and has a relative sense. Reinforced with the emphatic double negative, the assertion seems to imply that the notion M is something dependent and not independent, 
that it arises due to causes and conditions. In the explanation that follows, this dictum is substantiated by bringing in the five groups or aggregates relative to which one posits an M. The subsequent illustration serves to bring out the required nuance of the term Upadaya, which is more often connected with the rather gross idea of grasping. The young woman or the young man is looking at her or his face in a mirror. They can see their own face, or the sign of it, Mukkanimitta, only with the help of a mirror, that is, as an image reflected on it. They are dependent on a mirror or a similar object for seeing their own face, not independent. <coughs> what Venerable Punnamantani Putta seems to stress is that the notion M is the result of grasping or holding on to form, feeling, perception, preparations and consciousness. It is when one looks into a mirror that one suddenly becomes self-conscious. Whether one has a liking or a dislike for what one sees, one gets the notion, this is me. So it is by coming close to a mirror which reflects one's facial image that the notion M occurs depending on it. The word Upadaya therefore approximates to the idea of coming close and holding on to. That notion occurs due to a relationship arising from that holding on. Even if one already has no such notion, the moment one looks into a mirror, one is suddenly reminded of it, as if to exclaim, Ah, here I am. This is the gist of what Venerable Punnamantani Putta is trying to put across through this discourse. This shows that the conceit M arises due to the five grasping groups. The absolutive upadaya, though akin to upadana, has a deeper significance. It is a word suggestive of a relationship. It does not merely mean a holding on, but also a certain necessary relationship arising out of that holding on. Just as the looking into a mirror or a bowl of water give rise to a facial image as a reflection, here too, the relationship calls forth the deluded reflection, here I am. Given the notion, here I am, there follows the corollary, corollary, things that are mine. So there is supposed to be an I in contradistinction to things that are mine. It is the difficulty to demarcate the area of applicability between these two concepts that has given rise to insoluble problems. Who am I and what is mine? The 20 modes of personality view, Sakangaya Ditti, portray how one is at one's wit's end to solve this problem. Let us now see how the 20 modes of personality view are made up. For instance, as regards form, it is fourfold as follows Rupam Attato Samanupasati. Rupa Vantangva Atantanam, Atantaniva Rupan, Rupa Sningva Atantanam. He regards form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in self, or self as in form. It is the same with the other four groups. In this way, the personality view is altogether twentyfold. All this comes about due to the ignorance that name and form is only a reflection like that facial image. In grasping the self-image of name and form, one grasps the five groups. Attachment to name and form amounts to a holding on to these five groups. To many, the relationship between name and form and the grasping groups appears as a big puzzle. Wherever one looks, one sees the self-image of name and form. But when one grasps it, what comes within the grasp is a group of form, feeling, perception, preparations and consciousness. The magical illusion created by consciousness is so complete that it is capable of playing a dual role as in double acting. Because it reflects like a mirror, consciousness itself is grasped, just as one grasps the mirror. 
not only the reflection of the mirror, but the mirror itself is grasped. The grasping group of consciousness represents such a predicament. One can form an idea about the relation between name and form and consciousness by going deeper into the implications of this discourse. In the discussion of the interrelation between name and form, the Buddha makes use of two highly significant terms, namely Adivacana Sampassa and Padiga Sampassa. How conduct arises dependent on name and form is explained by the Buddha in the Mahanidana Sutta of the Diva Nikaya. It is addressed to Venerable Ananda in the form of a catechism. Passa or contact is a sort of hybrid, carrying with it the implications of both Adivacana Sampassa and Pratiga Sampassa. That is to say, it partakes of the character of name, Nama, as suggested by Adivacana Sampassa, as well as that of form, Rupa, indicated by Pratiga Sampassa. This will be clear from the relevant section of the Catechism in the Mahanidana Sutta. Nama Rupa Pachaya Passo Iti Kopanetan Buddha Tadananda Imina Petan Pariyayena Veritabbam Yata Nama Rupa Pachaya Passo Yehi Ananda Akarehi Ye Lingei Ye Nimittei Ye Uddesei Nama Kaya Sepanyati Hoti Te Su Akaresum Te Su Lingesum Te Su Nimittesum Te Su Uddesei Su Asati Apinukho rupa kai adivacana param passo panyaya tati nohetam bhante. Ye ananda karehi, ye lingehi, ye nimitte, ye udese, rupa kaya sapanyati hoti, te su akaresu, te su lingesu, te su nimitte su, te su udese su asati, apinukho nama kaya patigasam passo panyaya tati. Nohetan Bhante Yehi Ananda Akarehi Yehi Lingehi Yehi Nimitantehi Yehi Uddesehi Nama Kaya Sacha Rupa Kaya Sacha Panyat Dihoti Tesu Akaresu Tesu Lingesu Tesu Nimitantesu Tesu Uddesehi Asati Apinuko Adivachana Sampasova Patigga Sampasova Panyayatati no hetan bante. Ye ananda karehi, ye lingehi, ye nimitinte, ye udese, nama rupa sepanyati hoti, te su a karesu, te su lingesu, te su nimitinte su, te su udese su asati, apinuko passo panyayatati. No hetan bante. Tasmati ananda ese va hetu, etan idanan ese samudayo, ese pachayo passas, yadidang nama rupam. <coughs> From name and form as condition, contact comes to be. Thus it has been said above. And that ananda should be understood in this manner, too. As to how from name and form as condition contact arises. If Ananda all those modes, characteristics, signs and exponents by which the name group Namakaya is designated were absent, would there be manifest any verbal impression Adivachana Sampasa in the form group Rupakaya? There would not long. If Ananda all those modes, characteristics, signs and exponents by which the form group is designated were absent, would there be manifest any resistance impression, Patika Sampasu, in the name group? There would not, Lord. <coughs> and if Ananda all those modes, characteristics, signs and exponents by which there is a designation of both name group and form group were absent, would there be manifest either any verbal impression or any resistance impression? There would not, Lord. And if found under all those modes, characteristics, signs and exponents, by which there comes to be a designation of name and form were absent, would there be manifest any contact? There would not, Lord. 
We are far, Ananda. This itself is the cause. This is the origin. This is the condition for contact. That is to say, name and form. Translation of Bodhi. It was said, with name and form as condition, there is contact. How that is so, Ananda, should be understood in this way. If those qualities, traits, signs and indicators through which there is a description of the mental body were all absent, would designation contact be discerned in the material body? Certainly not, Manuel, sir. If those qualities, traits, signs and indicators through which there is a description of the material body were all absent, would impingement contact be discerned in the mental body? Certainly not, Manuel, sir. If those qualities, traits, signs and indicators through which there is a description of the mental body and the material body were all absent, would other designation contact or impingement contact be discerned? Certainly not, Manuel, sir. <coughs> if those qualities, traits, signs and indicators through which there is a description of the name and form were all absent, would contact be discerned? Certainly not, Manuel, sir. Therefore, Ananda, this is the cause, source, origin and condition for contact, namely name and form. End of comment. With the help of four words of a light sense, namely Akara, Mode, Linga, Characteristic, Nimitta, Sign and Uddesa exponent, the Buddha catechetically brings out four conclusions by this disquisition. They are 1. By whatever modes, characteristics, signs and exponents the name group Namakaya is designated, in their absence, no designation of verbal impression Adhivachana Sampasa in the form group Rupakaya is possible. 2. By whatever modes, characteristics, signs and exponents the form group is designated, in their absence, no designation of resistance impression Patika Sampasa. In the name group, Namakaya is possible. By whatever modes, characteristics, signs and exponents, both name group and form group are designated. In their absence, no designation of verbal impression or resistance impression is possible. By whatever modes, characteristics, signs and exponents, name and form is designated. In their absence, no designation of contact is possible. All this may well appear like a riddle, but then let us consider what name and form means to begin with. The definition we gave to Nama in our very first sermon happened to be different from the well-known definition nowadays given in terms of a bending. We interpreted Nama in the sense of a naming. Now this term Adivachana also conveys the same idea. Adivachana, synonym Niruti, nomenclature, and Panyati, designation, are part and parcel of linguistic usage. In the Nirutipatha Sutta of the Kanda Sangutta, one comes across three terms Nirutipatha, Adivachana Pata, and Panyati Pata, pathways of nomenclature, pathways of synonyms, pathways of designation. These three terms are closely allied in meaning, in that they bring out in sharp relief three aspects of linguistic usage. Niruti emphasizes the explanatory or expository function of language. Adivachana its symbolic and metaphorical character, while Panyati brings out its dependence on convention. What we have here is Adivachana Sampasa. Its affinity to name is obvious. And this is precisely the meaning we attributed to Nama. Therefore, what we have in this concept of Namakaya, or name group, literally name body, is a set of first principles in linguistic usage pertaining to definition. The form group, or Rupakaya, literally form body, on the other hand, has something to do with resistance, as suggested by the term Padika Sampasa. Padika means striking against. Form or Rupa has a striking quality, while Name or Nama has a descriptive quality. Passa or contact is a hybrid of these two. This is what gives a deeper dimension to the above disquisition. The point that the Buddha seeks to drive home 
is the fact that the concept of contact necessarily presupposes both name and form. In other words, name and form are mutually interrelated, as already stated above. There would not be verbal impression in the form group if there were no modes, characteristics, etc. proper to name. Likewise, there could be no resistance impressions in the name group if there were no modes, characteristics, etc. proper to form. At first sight, these two may appear as totally opposed to each other. But what is implied is a case of mutual interrelation. The expression peculiar to the name group is a necessary condition for the form group, while the resistance peculiar to the form group is a necessary condition for the name group. Comment. Yeah, I wanted to add that uh, formulation here used by the venerable should not be taken too literally and lead to a misunderstanding of what I believe he is trying to point out. This is again one of those occasions where in speaking during a talk one is not always able to have that total precision that one would have in a written, uh, when one writes an article or a book. The point is that there can be name without form, but there cannot be form without name. So the point is that uh, in particular in view of the a tendency in the Theravada exegetical tradition to, and also in modern meditation circles sometimes, to think, uh, to conceptualize the cultivation of insight in terms of a direct experience of form as an ultimate reality, as distinct from the use of concepts which are allocated to the realm of tranquility, this does not square with the viewpoint of the suttas. And as the Venomanyana makes it very clear, uh, there is basically no experience of form without name. There has to be at least that minimal conceptual input from the name side for processing the experience of form such that it can be experienced. The point that I wanted to make at this juncture <clears throat> is, however, that there can be experience of name without form, and that is the immaterial experiences. So the form group is not always a necessary condition for the name group. In fact, it is the precisely the absence of patiga of resistance that is characteristic of the attainment of the immaterial spheres. We usually get uh, the standard description for attaining the first of these immaterial spheres, which is the one of boundless space, and it speaks of Patiga Sanyan Atangama. So it's leaving behind the perception of resistance that one attains the immaterial sphere of boundless space, and based on that, then the others also. So it is clear that uh, Patiga contribution, if I may call it such, made by form to name is not an indispensable requirement for name as such. There can be name without form in those specific instances of the immaterial experiences by a meditator or the corresponding celestial realms. But this was just to, for the sake of clarity. End of comment. Since here we have something deep, let us go for an illustration for the sake of clarity. As we have already stated, a verbal impression in regard to the form group is there because of the constituents of the name group. Now the form group consists of the four great primaries, earth, water, fire and air. Even to distinguish between them by their qualities of hardness and softness, hotness and coolness, etc. Feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention, which are the constituents of the name group, have to play their part. 
Thus it is with the help of those members on the name side that the four basic elements associated with form receive recognition. Metaphor is a figure of speech, common in ornate literary language as well as in technical terminology. Here the inanimate is animated by personification. What is proper to the animate world is superimposed on the inanimate. Now the word adivachana is, even literally, a superimposition, and it is a term with obvious metaphorical associations, whereas in the literary field it has an ornate value as a figurative expression. In technical usage it serves the purpose of facility of expression by getting the tools to speak for themselves. For instance, a carpenter might speak of two planks touching each other, as if they can actually touch and feel. The concept of touch, even when it is attributed to inanimate objects, is the outcome of attention, in this case the attention of the carpenter. Here again we are reminded of the role of attention in the origination of things. As stated in the King Mulaka Sutta of the Samyini Sutta discussed above, in accordance with the dictum, mind is the forerunner of all things, all things are rooted in interest. They originate with attention and arise out of contact. Chanda Molaka Vosa Sambeda Mamana Sikara Sambhava Pasa Samudaya, etc. Wherever the carpenter's interest went, his attention discovered and picked up the thing. And here the thing is the fact of two planks touching each other. Interest, attention, and contact together bring out some deeper implications of the law of dependent arising, not only with regard to inanimate objects, but even in the case of this conscious body, the question of contact is related to the fact of attention. If, for instance, I ask what I am touching now, one might say that I am touching the palm leaf fan in my hand. This is because we usually associate the idea of touching with the hand that holds. But suppose I put away the fan and ask again what I am touching now. One might find it difficult to answer. It might not be possible for another to guess by mere external observation, since it is essentially subjective. It is dependent on my attention. It could even be my rope that I am touching in the sense of contact in which case I am becoming conscious of my body as apart from the robe I am wearing. Consciousness follows in the wake of attention. Whatever my attention picks up, of that I am conscious. Though I have in front of me so many apparently visible objects, until my attention is focused, I conscious does not come about. The basic function of this type of consciousness then is to distinguish between the eye and the object seen. It is only after the eye has become conscious that other factors necessary for sense perception fall into place. The two things born of that basic discrimination, together with the discriminating consciousness itself, that is, eye consciousness, make up the concept of contact. Chakuncha paticha rupe cha upampanjari cha ukovinyanam tinnang sangati passo. Dependent on eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The occurrence of the three, the concurrence of the three is contact. The same principle holds good in the case of the two planks touching each other. All this goes to show that it is with the help of the factors in the name group that we can, even metaphorically, speak of a contact between inanimate things. Let us now consider how resistance impression, Pratikasampasa, comes about. It is said that the factors of the form group have a part to play in producing resistance impression on the name group. We sometimes speak of an idea striking us, as if it were something material, or else an idea could be at the back of our mind and a word on the tip of our tongue. The clearest manifestation of contact is that between material objects, where collision is suggestive of resistance, as implied by the word pratika. This primary sense of striking against, 
or striking together is implicit even in the simile given by the Buddha in the Dhatavi Bhanga Sutta of the Madhyama Nikaya and in the Pasa Mulaka Sutta of the Sangyutta Nikaya concerning two sticks being rubbed together to kindle a fire. Though as a gross manifestation, contact is primarily associated with the form group, it is essentially connected with the name group, as we have already explained with the illustration. It is when both resistance impression and verbal impression come together that contact arises, dependent on name and form, nama rupa pachaya passu. Another point that needs to be clarified in this connection is the exact significance of the word rupa. This word has been variously interpreted and explained among different Buddhist sects. How did the Buddha define rupa? In ordinary usage, it can mean other forms visible to the eye or whatever is generally spoken of as material. Its exact significance has become a subject of controversy. What precisely do we mean by rupa? The Buddha himself has explained the word giving the following etymology in the Kanjaniya Sutta of the Kanna Samyutta in the Samyutta Nikaya. While defining the five groups there, he defines the form group as follows. Kincha bhikkave rupang vadetha rupati tikho bhikkave tasma rupandi vupunchati kena rupati Sitena pirupati, unhena pirupati, jigachaya pirupati, pipasaya pirupati, dansa makasa vata tapa serinsa sampasena pirupati. Rupati diko bhikkave tasma rupanti vujjati. And what monks do you call rupa? It is affected monks. That is why it is called rupa. Affected by what? Affected by cold, affected by heat, affected by hunger, affected by thirst, affected by contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, sun and serpents. It is affected monks, that is why it is called Rupa. Comment, translation by Bikku Bodhi. And why because do you call it form? It is deformed because, therefore it is called form. Deformed by what? Deformed by cold, deformed by heat, deformed by hunger, deformed by thirst. Deformed by contact with flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun and serpents. It is deformed because, therefore it is called form. In a footnote, Pico Bodhi explains that his choice of deformed is on purpose to try to give us a sense of the will play this um, playful etymology between Rupa and Rupati in the original. And here's my translation of the Samyutta Agama parallel. Since it can resist and can break, it is called the bodily form aggregate of clinging. This refers to being resistant. If it is by hand, if it is by stone, if it is by stick, if it is by knife, if it is by coldness, if it is by warmth, if it is by thirst, if it is by hunger, if it is by mosquitoes, gadflies, or any poisonous insects, or by contact with wind and rain, this is called resisting contact. Because of such resistance, it is called the bodily form aggregate of clinging. Again, this bodily form aggregate of clinging is impermanent, dukkha, and of a nature to change. And the last sentence has no parallel in the Pali. But I thought I, I include it because it brings out the, 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 the pointer towards insight. End of comment. This definition seems to convey something very deep, so much so that various Buddhist sects came out with various interpretations of this passage. The Buddha departs from the way of approach taken up by the materialistic systems of thought in the world in defining rupa with rupati being affected. It is not the inanimate trees and rocks in the world that are said to be affected by cold and heat, but this conscious body. Though this body is not conceived of as a bundle of atoms to be animated by introducing into it a life faculty, jivit indriya, what is meant by rupa is this same body, 
This body with form, which for the meditator is a fact of experience. Attempts at interpretation from a scholastic point of view and created a lot of complications. But the definition as it stands is clear enough. It is directly addressed to experience. The purpose of the entire Dhamma preached by the Buddha is not to encourage an academic dabbling in philosophical subtleties with a mere jumble of words. The purpose is utter disenchantment, dispassion and cessation. Therefore, the etymology given here in terms of rupa being to be affected is in full accord with that purpose. Rupa is so called because it is affected by cold, heat, and the sting of cat flies, mosquitoes, etc., not because of any atomism in it. If we are to examine further the meaning of this word Rupati, we can count on the following quotation from the Pingya Sutta of the Parayana Vanga in the Sutta Nipata. It runs Rupati Rupe Sujana Pamatta. Heedless men are affected in regard to forms. Comment and translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. People who are heedless afflicted by forms. End of comment. The canonical commentary Chula Nidendesa, commenting on the word, brings out the various nuances connected with it. Rupanteti, Kupanti, Pilayanti, Gattayanti, Bhyadita, Dumanasita, Honti. Rupanti means to be adversely affected, to be afflicted, to come into contact with, to be diseased and displeased. Surely it is not the trees and rocks that are affected in this manner. It is this animate body that is subject to all this. The pragmatic purpose of utter detachment, dispassion and cessation is clear enough, even from this commentary. <coughs> what is known as the form group, Rupakanda, is one vast wound with nine bad apertures. This wound is affected when it is touched by cold and heat, when gut flies and mosquitoes land on it. This wound gets irritated by them. We come across yet another canonical reference in support of these nuances in the following two lines in the Uttana Sutta of the Sutta Nipata. Atura nanhi ka nidda salavidhana ruppatam. For what sleep could there be for those who are afflicted, being pierced with a dart? Comment, translation by Bhikkhubodhi. For what sleep can there be for the afflicted, for those injured, pierced by the dart? End of comment. These two lines stress the need for heedfulness, for beings pierced with the arrow of craving. Here too, the verb rupati has the sense of being affected or afflicted. All this goes to show that the early Buddhist concept of rupa had a striking similarity about it, simplicity about it. As we have already stated at the very outset, the teachings in the discourses are simple enough. But there is a certain depth in this very simplicity, for it is only when the water is lucid and limpid that one can see the bottom of a pond. But with the passage of time there was a tendency to lose interest in these discourses because of the general predilection for complexity. Materialistic philosophers in particular were carried away by this trend, whether they were Hindus or Buddhists. Modern-day scientists too, got caught in this trend. They pursued the materialistic overtones of the word Rupa without realizing that they are running after a mirage. They went on analyzing matter until they ended up with an atomism and grasped a heap of concepts. The analysis of matter thus precipitated a grasping of a mass of concepts. Whether one grasps a pole or a mole, it is grasping all the same. The Buddha's admonitions, on the contrary, point in a different direction. He pointed out that in order to be free from the burdensome oppression of form, one has to be free from the perception of form. What is of relevance here is the very perception of form, Rupa Samya. From the point of view of Dhamma, any attempt at analysis of the materialistic concept of form or any microscopic analysis of matter would lead to a pursuit of a mirage. 
This fact the modern day scientist is now in a position to appreciate. He has found that the mind with which he carries on the analysis is influencing his findings at every level. In other words, he has been running after Mirage due to his ignorance of the mutual interrelation between name and form. One would not be in such a plight if one understands that the real problem at issue is not that of form, but of the perception of form. In an earlier sermon, we happen to quote a verse which makes it extremely clear. Let us now hark back to that verse which occurs in the Jata Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. Yatta namanche rupanche asesam uparudjati patigam rupa sanyacha ette sa chidjate jata. By name and form, as well as resistant, resistance and perception of form, are completely cut off. It is there that the tangle gets snapped. Common translation by Bigger Body. Where name and form ceases, stops without remainder, and also impingement and perception of form, it is here the tangle is cut. End of comment. The entire samsaric problem is solved when the tangle gets snapped. Name and form, resistance and perception of form are completely cut off in that non-manifestative consciousness mentioned in our earlier sermons. That, in effect, is the end of the tangle within and the tangle without. Our discussion of the law of dependent rising must have made it clear that there is an interrelation between name and form and consciousness on the one hand, and between name and form themselves on the other. This then is a case of a tangle within and a tangle without. Like the central spot of a whirlpool, the deepest point of the entire formula of Patitya Samapada is traceable to the interrelation that obtains between name and form on the one hand, and between name and form and consciousness on the other. As far as the significance of perception of form is concerned, the true purpose of the spiritual endeavor, according to the Buddha, is the very freedom from this perception of form. How does perception of form come about? It is due to that striking against, or resistance. Perception of form arises, for instance, when gadflies and mosquitoes land on this body. As we have already mentioned, even the distinctions of hard and soft, etc., with which we recognize the four elements, is a matter of touching. We are only trying to measure and gauge the four great primaries of this human frame. We can never ever comprehend fully the gamut of these four great primaries, but we are trying to understand them through this human frame in a way that is meaningful to our lives. All kinds of beings have their own specific experience of touch in relation to their experience of the four elements. So what we have here is entirely a question of perception of form. <coughs> the true purpose then should be the release of one's mind from this perception of form. It is only when the mind is free from resistance and the perception of form, as well as from name and form, that one can win to the deliverance from this problem of the tangle within and the tangle without, that is, samsara. Yet another fact emerges from the above discussion. The two views of existence and non-existence, bhava and vimbhava, asserting an absolute existence and an absolute non-existence, seem to have posed an insoluble problem to many philosophers. Concerning the origin of the world, they wondered whether sat or being came out of asat or non-being, or vice versa. All these problems arose out of a misunderstanding about form or material objects, as we may well infer from the following two lines of a verse in the Kalahavibhada Sutta of the Sutta Nipata. Rupe Sutisva Vibhavang Bhavancha Vinipjayam Kurute Janduloke. Having seen the existence and destruction of material forms, a man in this world comes to a conclusion. Common translation by Bhikkhubodhi. Having seen the vanishing and coming to be of forms, a person forms a judgment in the world. End of comment. What is the conclusion? 
that there is an absolute existence and an absolute non-existence. One comes to this conclusion drawing an inference from the behavior of visible objects. For instance, we could presume that this machine before us exists in an absolute sense, ignoring the causes and conditions underlying its existence. The day this machine is destroyed, we would say it was, but now it is not. The Buddha has pointed out that such absolute views of existence and non-existence are a result of an incorrect understanding about form. What actually is involved here is the perception of form. Due to a misconception about the perception of form, the world inclines towards the two extreme views of absolute existence and absolute non-existence. So the whole point of our discussion today has been the clarification of the mutual interrelation between name and form, to show that name and form itself is only an image or a shadow reflected in consciousness. Comment the salient point, as the Venerable has just said, is again on name and form, particularly on the interrelation between the two, and a topic that uh, also came up during the first part of the sermon for me with particular strength is the whole idea of the clinging to the I am conceit.